I would argue that the greatest advances in, in the history of medicine by far, the greatest practical advances, are understanding the role of infection and interfering with them. And if you interfere with an essential cause of disease, then you're going to prevent that disease. I want to impress on you that this issue of infectious cause of disease is not only the issue that I think has led to the greatest advances in medicine because we can interfere with infection, with vaccines, with anti-infectives, with hygiene and also with other environmental influences such as improvements in diet. But it looks like it's the greatest revolution of the future. I think it's a continuing revolution. And what I mean by that is illustrated in this summary of information that I've extracted from medical texts. On this figure I've just plotted the acceptance at any given decade of infection as a cause of any particular disease and I've quantified the percentages of diseases that would be accepted as having infection as, a, as an essential or primary cause. And then similarly, I've, I've plotted the percentage of diseases that have been accepted as having some environmental cause, very broadly defined, or a genetic cause. And when, when I actually did this, I was astonished to, to see what the results looked like. In spite of the fact that the last 50 years has been the heyday of understanding genes and the role of genes in health and disease, the overwhelming trend, trend is that throughout the last one and a quarter centuries, there's been this steady increase in the proportion of disease entities that have been accepted as caused by infection. And I didn't put the last 10 years on it, I haven't actually finished tallying all the data, but it's essentially following the same trend. There's this steady increase. I think the first way of organizing this thinking, at least for me, is to think about primary or essential causes of diseases and exacerbating or secondary uh, causes of disease. And I, I think this is a terribly important distinction because um, if we identify, let's say, infection as a primary cause of a disease or an essential cause, something that uh, is necessary for the disease actually to be present, then interfering with infection is likely to give us tremendous bang for the buck because you can prevent the disease. You know, one would have thought, well, the germ theory was something that happened in the last part of the 19th century, and so there'd be this big increase in the percentage of diseases that are accepted as caused by infection, you know, prior to 1900, maybe beginning of the 20th century. But really, it's, uh, even though there was an increase, that there's been this steady progression. So what I've decided to do is focus on cancer. So I'm really going to be dealing with a very simple question. What causes cancer? And based on what looks like the emerging answer, what are the implications for how we can more, much more successfully deal with cancer than we dealt with it in the past? This revolution in understanding cancer has really been dramatic, but as is often the case, when we're in the midst of a revolution, we really don't under, we don't, often don't recognize it. Maybe those infectious agents evolve to disrupt the barriers to cancer. And so maybe, as is indicated by that diagram on the right, <coughs> they're actually involved as a primary cause. And of course now we realize that, that, that that's reasonable for cervical cancer. But the question is, is this what's going on in most other cancers and, uh, that are accepted as caused by infection? And what are the implications for the probable causes of all those cancers, the remaining 80%? for which we really don't understand causation very well. For these best studied viral causes of cancer, the answer is every one of those viruses breaks down every one of these barriers to cancer. Okay, so let's talk about the pathogenesis of chlamydia pneumonia. It's an airborne pathogen the chlamydia infects the epithelial cells in the respiratory tract. It not only survives phagocytosis by macrophages, that's a preferred home. Chlamydia infect immune cells. They're known to affect every single immune cell that the human body has. So if they infect immune cells and steal energy from the immune cell, I submit to you that they are causing an immune dysfunction process. 
In fact, there aren't too many cells, if you read the medical literature, that can't be infected by chlamydia species. And when they infect cells, they cause persistent infections. I tell people chlamydia are like diamonds. They're forever. If, in fact, there is a stealth infection in these cells and the immune system goes after them, then you would argue, well, that's an autoimmune disease. But it may not be. It may just simply be that that's the infection. Cells infected with chlamydia also produce heat shock protein 60, which is pro-inflammatory. Chlamydial infected cells produce all of the components of inflammation that you would need to have chronic and persistent inflammation in the infected tissues. So here are some of the diseases that people have been studying in which they think chlamydia pneumoniae infection may play a role. Atherosclerosis, asthma, Alzheimer's. We've been involved with multiple sclerosis, pyoderma gangrenosum, interstitial cystitis. These are just some of the diseases that chlamydia has been associated with. What's the evidence in MS? We have found chlamydia pneumoniae in the CSF, including positive cultures in 64% of the patients that we were studying. We found the presence in brain tissue. We have found that the oligoclonal bands in CSF react with chlamydial antigens. If we identify, let's say, infection as something that is necessary for the disease actually to be present, then interfering with infection is likely to give us tremendous bang for the buck because you can prevent the disease.